Can say him by name. Can say at least five other people by name. Say him, say their names by name, five. Brother, 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 brother. <laughs> Jimmy, you know everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, before you leave, um, it is okay not to know everybody. It is a sin not to meet someone new. So it's okay to leave and say, hey, I didn't even meet Jose. Who's Jose? And, but it is a sin to not meet somebody new. Uh, and so uh, here's your first challenge. If anybody wants a t-shirt, find out who is the youngest person and who is the oldest person in attendance today. <laughs> who is the youngest person? First person to come up to me and verify me. I pretty much got a, got a grip on it. If, if you think you can find the youngest and the oldest first one to give me that information, you get one of these incredible valuable t-shirts. And so, uh, I'm going to excuse oh, you. Uh, <laughs> No accusations. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to invite you to stand even though I'm sitting down. I've got a little bit of an ankle issue going on. I'm going to invite you to stand. Some of the songs you might not fully know. If you don't know them, we'll practice them a little bit. But uh, uh, let's sing together. There is something incredible when men sing together. Yeah, yes. All right, let's sing. Yeah. Anybody know Chris Tomlin? The man Chris Tomlin? Yeah. This is one of his first songs. It goes like this. I mean, I am strength. You are
So I don't know if I'll use the mic or not. I think a lot of people can hear me. <coughs> what? Huh? <laughs> Why don't you raise it, David, because it'll get on a CD better that way. All right. Thank you. Praise God. Absolutely. What an awesome thing it is to be able to speak to you guys today. What an honor. What an honor. From where I've been and where I am now. So I grew up in Southern California, and I was born into a family that was not wealthy. Uh, my parents aren't wealthy now, but uh, I always had everything I needed, everything and more. There's thousands of feet of eight millimeter films of family gatherings, and, uh, with generations of people getting together and having a good time on holidays, sharing laughs, creating memories. Those are all recorded on film. I attended public school, rode my bicycle past Disneyland every day on the way to school. This was just a, a, a life that what other kid could, uh, you know, could want. We had unlimited admission to the park through my grandfather. Uh, a place that he worked uh, gave him tickets, and we went, we went every day until it just became boring. How could Disneyland be boring? Uh, Big fall tickets at Anaheim Stadium to see the Angels, 10 rows up behind the third base dugout, right? Uh, right there. Today, that's uh, unreachable. You can hardly even get those movie stars and all get those tickets. Right? But then, then it wasn't such a big deal. But it still was. I mean, Dad provided for us awesome, awesome things. He would take us and drop us off at the ballpark and just leave us there to, to do whatever he did while we were gone. Uh, we had access to the luxury box from the owner. Gene Autry was the owner. Um, I never met him. My mom and dad spent time with him at the place um, when they would have other events besides baseball, like Supercross. We would go there and, and have just awesome seats to see, right? Just this life, this beautiful life. This wonderful everything. Dirt bikes, dune buggies, girlfriends, streaking. It's during the 70s, remember that? It was all, what is it? Regular dental visits, medical care. I knew I recognized you, David. Yeah, <laughs> from the back. <laughs> My mom and dad rarely ever fought. I can't think of a time when they did. Ever. I don't know how they worked it out. I have no idea. Church was there, but it wasn't an overwhelming thing. We went when I was younger. Um, I was more interested in what pancake syrup flavor I'd have when we'd have breakfast at Sambo's. Anybody remember Sambo's? Yeah. Sambo's. That's still in business. That did not go out of business. There's still one in Southern California, the original one. Wow. So all that sounds dreamy, right? It was a wonderful childhood, but there was a wickedness. There was a wickedness in this. I was sexually molested by a babysitter when I was nine. By the son of a babysitter. Forgive me for uh, imputing that woman. No, it wasn't her, it was her son. His name was Peter. I remember that. I remember his name. I remember every detail, every single thing. I remember his house. I don't dwell on it, gentlemen. It doesn't drag me down. Your kids remember everything. That's right. Come on. That's right. Oh, so that oh it's 1971. Ooh. Huge LA earthquake, right? I remember that too. <laughs> and the top of my bunk bed. 1974, my dad got us tickets to the World Series. LA versus Oakland. I wasn't a fan of either one. But those guys were awesome. I was an Angel fan, right? We had Angel tickets. Why aren't the Angels in the World Series? Why aren't they playing it at Anaheim Stadium? But, you know, Catfish Hunter, Raleigh Fingers, Vita Blue, those guys were awesome. That year I smoked weed for the first time. Um, during the summer, we'd go down to, we'd get on a bus. You could still get on a bus as a little kid by yourself and go to the beach. We would go to Newport Beach and and uh, hang out there all day. We made skimboards. You know what skimboards are? I think now they're kind of pointed, but if, if there's a nice flat beach with there's a wave 
come in, they leave a, a, a thin layer of water when the beach is really flat and wide. And you run and you throw this board, you toss this board out, and you try and catch up to it and jump on it and skim across and skim across the water. A lot of concussions doing that. <laughs> Where the bus, where we got on the bus, there was this place called the House of Pie. Um, best strawberry pie ever, anywhere. Sorry, Brenda. But it's awesome. And unmatched. That place is not there anymore. It's a, a resort now, a 20 story, multi wing hotel that's part of the Disneyland complex. Everything changes. Right? Everything moves. Everything changes. We moved to Clo Cloverdale in Northern California when I was 17. Um, my father saw it as protection for us as we grew up in Southern California from what he, he thought was uh, urban disease sneaking into his white America. Cloverdale was quite a change from there. Um, the house came with a goat, uh, a dog, and no TV. We could listen to KGO radio, and that was it. That was the only thing that reflected into this little valley way up in Northern California along the coast. Um, but the Russian River Valley, for kids growing up, was good to, a good choice for him. Um, we would have done a lot of destruction if we were in a city somewhere. I'm not sure where I'd ended up. But being there, we could run wild. Did a lot of inner tubing on the Russian River. That was something Walt could never provide, no matter how he tried. We would float down the river on inner tubes and just over lazy, over lazy falls and rocks, and most of the time we were drinking. 16 or 8, 17 to 18 years old, just cooler hats on too. Second time I smoked weed. Was uh, on a, on a, one of the uh, levees that contained the Russian River with Mark, Tom, and Jeff. Those were guys that would be uh, my my core. Three of the four guys that would be the guys I hung out with. Uh, that entire I could I could I could talk for hours, and I'm sure as I'm sure almost all of you could about all the details of growing up in that life right, around that age. Just awesome times. We all grew up to be engineers. Um, some civil, some electronic, some electrical, but that's the crowd that I grew up with. Um, some would say it's privileged. Some, would, I'm not sure what others might say, but that's that's who I that's where I was. I had two lives: when I lived at church for church functions, the other one I lived at night. All through that time, I smoked a lot of weed. This is Northern California. It's the Emerald Triangle. Like it's just what people did. Only once at school, though, there's always a limit. Always, there's, there's always has been a limit for me. Well, I'm going to do this much wrong, but gee, not this much. I know it's wrong, and I'm going to do this much, but I won't go there. Kind of strange when we arbitrarily draw the line. Um, was, like I said at the time, I was regularly attending the First Baptist Church of Cloverdale. Uh, back then there was an altar call. Uh, some of you remember altar calls, some of you don't, but at the end of every service, the pastor would, would call people and you would walk up and, 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 and either be saved for the first time or confess for, uh, looking for forgiveness. And, and I was, several times I was compelled to make that perp walk up the center Finally, I overcame my fears, and during the hymn of uh, Just As I Am, I didn't remember a lot of stuff, but I remember that. Just As I Am was playing, and I was saved, but not changed. Kept going to church, kept that mask on. Drugs kept flowing in. Bigger. Cocaine, mushrooms, acid. I enlisted in the Air Force in 1981. A guy asked me if I ever used drugs. I said, say no. <laughs> no, no, I never did. Right? Uh, and 
I was thrown out in 1983. Could not or would not behave one or the other. I think it was would not. Um, after I left there, I met my wife at a job in Palo Alto. And man, from the first time I saw her, I lusted after her. I had nobody's business. What was I, 20, 21 years old? <coughs> We finally got together off our first date. We, we never separated after that. We were a perfect match. Everything we did was perfect about each other. Music, movies, our sex drives were... Our methamphetamine use was right parallel with each other. We moved in together, somehow hung on to our jobs after sleepless nights, all, all night. Bump on the way out the door, and I was good to go. I don't know how we hung on the door, job, but we did. She proposed to me, and I married her. Um, that's backwards, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> our date, we said our date, and then she became pregnant. So that moved the date in. Uh, we were married in 1986. In a godless ceremony in somebody's house without a pastor. Our son was born six months later. Our daughter 14 months after that. We struggled mightily in, in every way. Uh, Target once a month. We could spend 80 bucks at Target once a month other than just groceries and gas. And get diapers, you gotta feed the kids, pay daycare. Both of us jobs, but completely blind, completely blind to the reality that we were never gonna be able to raise these kids the way we needed to raise them. The way you, the, the resources that it takes to raise children is, you can't do it from there. We struggled along, slowly growing apart, and one day it exploded. 1995, I took custody of my son, my wife took custody of my daughter. We would alternate weekends but that's kind of a rough time for kids, for adults, but it never, looking back it wasn't something that completely destroyed me, it never brought me to my knees, it never brought me to, to curse my life, to just another thing I had to deal with. I'd stopped doing drugs during the time we were married, if you don't include alcohol. But you do, right? It's all rationalizing. Mm -hmm. My son and I moved into a mobile home in Sunnyvale and tried to start over. Uh, one of the most heart-wrenching things I ever had to deal with, I ever had to hear from my son, was when he would tell me, as I tried to tuck him in, in this quiet, innocent voice, he would say, I wish mom was here to talk to me. Really wasn't too long after that that Trish and I began to know each other differently. The, the fog that we had been in with alcohol and drugs and started to clear it. And it's sort of a different story. Um, it's not one that's common. But I remarried her. 2000. I tell you what, you want to see your ex mother in law and your mom blow a gasket? Remarry your ex wife. <laughs> I'm not saying do that. There's a lot of easier ways to go about things, but uh, we, we attended a church together. We were married in a church with a pastor. But still, it was a double life for me. I hadn't committed my life to God, to do things for God. It was a tool. I was playing a part, but I wasn't living my life in a way that glorified Him. I was still under the illusion that I did all this myself, that I could do it. I had made, and what an illusion it is, what a mess I made, and what a, what a mess to clean up. Gee, how proud to be of that. 
Look what I did. Um, but as difficult as all of that was, keeping in mind everything that, that I had done before, my life was smooth. I had the, the things I faced, the things I dealt with was really not outside of ordinary trials and tribulations that we all face. Um, and they were I've never been to that bottom. I, I still have not been there. That point where my soul is just broken and I cry out to God to save me from whatever it is I've created. But there was still a point where everything, everything changed for me. Trish and I were for the, the umpteenth time cleaning out stuff around our house, boxes of things we didn't know we'd moved nine years before that we'd never been in, and so we were just, well, we never looked in that one, we threw it out. And we never looked in this box, so we just threw it out. We didn't bother looking. Very efficient way of doing things. Like, why bother going through it? I know you've all got boxes you move from house to house to house to house that you'd never even look in. Legal papers from my divorce attorney, what am I going to need those for? I hung on those for a long time. The baggage that we drag along with us for what? Well, Sunday comes one Sunday, and I'm kicking around the house. That Sunday, following the time that we did this, and I'm not sure what triggered me, but something, something pricks me. In my mind, I'm hearing that voice. I'm hearing that voice. You guys know what voice that is I'm talking about? Everybody here know that voice? You will someday. But this voice says to me, seen your Bible lately? It's not always that proverbial piece of lumber that whacks you on the side of the head. Right? So I went and I looked on the bookshelf where I hold all the books I'm going to use again someday. A single variable calculus, geometry, history of Western civilization, you know, stuff you're going to read, for sure. Uh, it's not there. I go back to my dresser where I, I keep in my top right drawer, nobody here is going to break into my house, right? In the top right drawer of my dresser is where I keep stuff that I'm going to use. I, I need that. It's not there either. Heart rate picks up a little bit. I walk down the hall, open a big door into my garage, turn right out the side door, and there's the garbage cans that uh, I open up and I reach around and, and slide some things apart, and I don't, I don't really see anything. And I lift up the lid to a box, and there it is. There's my Bible in the garbage. Immediately, I reach into the garbage to pick the Bible out, but God's not done. It's not that easy. I've done this before. <coughs> that voice comes back in my head. That voice tells me, you can throw me back in the trash. You don't have to pull me out. Garbage pickups tomorrow. I'll never bother you. Have you ever, any of you ever thought of God as being passive-aggressive? Suddenly I'm terrified. My heart is just gone. My heart is not beating fast. I don't have one. Time is still for me. And I say, of course, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up, take that book out of there right now. That's not what God is asking me. He says, you've got to make a choice right now. You have walked away from me again and again. I've made things easy for you, and you walked away. And you have done it over and over again. He wants a decision right now to get committed. So a year later, 
because I never commit to anything. Trish volunteers for me to play guitar here at Westside Community Church. And since she says she'll come to church every day, or she'll come to church every time, as long as I'm playing, I decide I'll do it because I need to fix her. <laughs> right? Never mind what happened to me. I need to fix her. But steadily, steadily from there and from being involved and from being part of this church, my walk with God has come, has been on a climb. For me, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, 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 a complete breaking down of my spirit, of my soul. It, it's been a, a, just a constant walk. Part of that is that not everything from my past is a memory I want to let go of. There's all kinds of great things I've done. I've been a good person. I've, had, I've done a lot of good things. Because of all those things, Satan is after me all the time. You're a good person. In fact, while I was writing this, he says, this is stupid. You're not saved. The whole time I'm right, you're not worthy. Much of me is still who I was. But now, everything I do, I do to glorify God. Whatever I do. My old body of work is just in ruins behind me. It's all gone. It's all, it's there, but I live to glorify God. There's a new freedom in me to love and care for others that I, I, I had before, but I kept it inside. Every day when I get up, I praise God for another opportunity to serve Him. They used to call me El Diablo at work. Awesome, right? I loved it. They feared me. Now they smile at me. They see something different in me. I hunger to study scripture, to know it, to live it. Uh, following his lead and his direction, not mine. I'm 12 units away uh, from a bachelor's degree in Bible and theology. Not sure where that's going, but I heard him say, you know, you need to get prepared to serve. You need to get prepared to move on to the next step I have planned for you. In five short years, after finally taking on that yoke, the yoke of Jesus Christ, yes. he has taken me to a place I never saw coming. And I've never been more content. I just love to read scripture, to try and imagine what the culture must be like at the time it was said. Uh, what it smelled like, was it noisy? I really want to put myself into what was said and, and who was saying it and, and, and who was hearing it so I can understand how to take that and apply it in my life and teach others. My first filter when I do do that or bias or whatever, whatever we might call it is how is God's love for any, all mankind communicated in this passage that I'm reading or word or sentence. If I can't see it, I'm not reading it. Right. That's also my last book before I teach somebody what the word of God says. It has to come through love. For some that makes me a liberal, I'm okay with that. If when I'm gone somebody says he loved too much, praise God. For me, it, it's all that happened overnight. It's been a long, long, long time, and it continues to grow. It can, I continue to grow in, in my faith with Him and in my love for Him and, and in the way I serve Him. And my prayer for you today is that some of you would take that step if you haven't, or see that, that new opportunity to grow. Because everything about you will change.
was 21 years old. From their worry about me, because they could see where I was at.
good, gentlemen? Yeah. All right, praise God. It's, it's such a blessing and such an honor to be here as well and see all these great men here. Praise God. That brings me joy to my heart as well. God is good. God is good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Uh, guess what book we're turning to? Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 27, 17. 717, gentlemen. As you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord God. Thank you for this day, Lord. Bringing, drawing all these men here today, Lord God, so that we may sharpen one another, Heavenly Father. You are good, Lord. We want to honor you, Lord God, by going through your scriptures this morning, Heavenly Father. And we pray that as we open up your word, Lord, that you would open up our hearts, open up our minds, Lord God, and let your spirit move in our lives, Heavenly Father. That is what we ask, Lord God, so that the Holy Spirit may apply your words into our lives, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, as iron sharpens iron, we get together as a body of men, sharpening one another with the word of God. We sharpen one another with the words, by the fellowship, how we come together here. This is iron is sharpening iron. This is great. This is good. This is what the Lord wants. Yes, amen. You know, God, we were made to have friendships. We were made to love and be loved. We were made to serve and to be served. The day we got saved, God became our father. And if you look around you, you have made many brothers. Yes. We are all brothers here. We all become one in him. That is what God has showed us. Uh, that is what he wants to continue to do in our lives. He's continue to unite us, bring us together so that we can sharpen, we can be there for one another. That's what God wants. Amen. You know, in the ancient times, battles were won when an army would surround the city and cut off its supply line. In times, the city would either surrender or starve to death when the enemy would surround it. Surround it, that's what they wanted to do. Either surrender or starve. And this still happens today when Satan brings down, that's how Satan brings down Christians. He cuts off our supply lines. <clears throat> he isolates them from other believers. He isolates you. Who might, other believers who could come and offer either care for you or offer help. That's what the Satan does. And he's very good at it. He loves to isolate brother, men from each other. Separate us. He loves to do that. Have you guys ever seen on the, um, uh, I love watching uh, Nat Geo Wild. <laughs> you, see these, you see these animals, you see all the deers grazing, all these antelopes, all, they're just great. They're all eating together. Eating. Not thinking what's going on around them. And then you see the camera turn this way. And all of a sudden you see this lion praying, stalking, Stalking them slowly. It's very, very smart how they work. Very smart how these lines work together. They all, they'll surround them. Some will come from this way. Other lines will go this way. And their objective is to what? Single out. Want, separate them. They'll run after them. All of a sudden you see the deers running. They all scatter. And what they'll do is what? Choose one. They'll go after one. The sick ones, <laughs> they go after the weak and the sick ones. That's the ones they go after. The ones that are not, what happens with Christians? The ones that are not fellowshipping. The ones that are not reading their words. The ones that isolate themselves. Say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need Bible studies. I don't need that. I don't need that. Guess who's the target? Guess who the lion is targeting? You know, there's a story of a, a dad who told his son. He came and he brought him a bundle of sticks. 
all these twigs together. I don't big bone twigs. Put them down to give them to his son. He said, son, I want you to break these big bundle of twi uh, sticks. I'll be back. Let me know how that goes. And he leaves. The dad leaves. The son is like, man, how do I break these? He, you know, hits him on his knees. Boom. And he's trying to chop them. And he's stepping on them. And he's doing all these things in order to break the sticks. And he can't. He can't break them. He doesn't understand. Like, man, how does... How does my dad expect me to break these? I don't understand. Finally, his dad comes home. His dad looks at him and says, So did you get it? Were you able to break the sticks? He goes, No, I don't understand. I don't understand how you want me to break these sticks. It's unbreakable. The dad goes, Let me see. He grabs the bundle. Now, they were tied up. He unties it. He ties the bundle. And what's he do? He starts to break the sticks. One at a time. If God can untie us and separate us, if He can do that in your life and separate you from the rest of the flock, <clears throat> Satan can break you. And He will break you. He has no mercy on us. We make the... I don't, I don't care who you are. I don't care how many years you've been serving the Lord. Don't ever think that you can be stronger than Him. He will break you. And he will, <laughs> he will make you so discouraged to not want to follow him anymore. We need to stick together, brothers. Men, can we do that? Can we stick together? A few of you over here can. Men, come here. <laughs> um, uh, that is what God wants to do in our lives. Keep us united. Keep us united. You know that... God created the church for such a time as this. God created, He birthed the church for such a time as this right now. Yeah. We need Him right now. We need each other. Yeah. I need you as much as you need me. We do. We need each other. Don't ever think that, that you don't have anything to offer. We do. We do. You have everyone here. We, every one of you has something. You guys can encourage me. And I can encourage you back. Amen. That's what God wants to do. So we sharpen one another with the word. But just even, if you guys can even invite me to Starbucks. Now, man, that's encouraging to me. That's how you guys can sharpen me. Praise God. But that's what we said. We, you know, uh, we come to church. God created the church for this specific moment in time right now. But sadly to say, many men miss the point. They just miss it. They come, they hear the message, they lift up hands, and then leave right out that church. Don't even know anybody. Don't even stop to say, hey, what's your name? I haven't met you. Don't even say that. They think that this is it, and that's it. I'm going home. I've done my church. That's it. See you next Sunday. Wow. Some of us, including me, I say us. We see each other sometimes, even at the store. They're like, hey, he goes to my church. My girlfriend will be like, do you know him? I don't know. But I know he goes to my church. <laughs> what good is that? We can be in the same church and not even know each other. How sad is that? We need to stick together. We need to stick together. So if we can do that, believe me, we will become stronger and the Lord can do great things in our lives when we stick together. We become strong. You know, uh, some of us, we try to play this um, Lone Ranger Christianity. You know, we hide, we hide behind this Lone Ranger mask. And we remain unknown to other brothers. We remain unknown to people. You hide behind this mask. You know? And nobody knows you. We just try to hide behind a mask. We come to church. Don't talk to me. Don't even ask me questions. I just lift up my hands and that's it. Don't ask me about my family. Don't ask me how my finances are. Don't ask me how my marriage is. I'm here for God. And that's it. Don't ask me nothing. Why? Why? 
And then when somebody does ask us a question, we get offended. Oh, why? What? What? what what'd you hear? <laughs> why? What'd you hear? Who told you that? Just concerned, brother. I'm just somebody who cares. That's it. I'm just someone who cares. But if you can't do that, what good are we? And why even come? Why have brothers? Why did God make the church? We're supposed to be united. We're here for one another. And if you're not here for one another, then what God, the enemy's got us. He has us. We need to surround ourselves with godly men. I need men who are going to help me, not hinder me. I need men who can encourage me, not flatter me. I need men who will tell me the truth and not lie to me. When there's something in my life, when there's something wrong in my life, in my walk, I need someone to come and tell me the truth and not think that it's okay. The truth hurts, but I'm a man. We're men here, right? We can handle that. You know, but what happens sometimes in, um, in ministry, you know, I hear people sometimes, and they, you know, that says, oh man, you hear their testimony, and this is, you know, oh man, I did this, and I used to be in this, and this. All of a sudden, they become Christians and become sissified. Can I use that word here? Sissified. All of a sudden, oh, would, would you, you offended me by saying that, brother. Oh, you offended me by saying, come on, man. Are we supposed to be men or what? You gotta have tough skin. We got a tough skin. We're men. Yeah. We're men. You don't let anything, little words, you know, bother you. Oh, that, 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 that hurt me, brother. I understand. I know that words can cut. And we'll talk about that. I understand that. Don't get, offended. don't get offended by every single word that somebody tells you, though. We gotta, we gotta continue to move forward and let the Lord work on our lives. I'm drawn, I'm drawn to encouragers. I love people who, who, are, who know how to encourage us. I'm drawn to those sort of people. I, I, I am. I love that. You know why? Because I'm weak. I'm weak. I am. I need people to encourage me. It doesn't matter if I'm up here or leading Bible studies. I'm weak. I need help. I need encouragement. I need people to come alongside of me and say, bro, do you need prayer? We all need prayer. I'll never, I will never turn down prayer from anybody. I'm weak. I need help. <laughs> we all need that. Um, it doesn't matter about titles or anything like that. It's, it's about encouraging one another. That's what we need. We, we need men who will continue to pray. We need God-fearing men. God needs men right now at this time that are going to be prayer warriors, that are going to stand up for the truth, that are going to say, you know what, no, I don't do that. I'm a Christian man. I love, I love my wife. Or I love my kids. I'm not going to do that. I love God too much. And I'm not going to compromise. Amen. Yeah. No compromising. Amen. That's, what, that's the kind of men God wants. Men that will lead your families. Men that can lead your families. Be a husband, a father to your children. That's what, kind, that's what God wants, right? Amen. That's what He wants. That's what God is looking for. You know, when God called His disciples, how many did He call? Twelve. He called twelve disciples. Twelve men. Men disciples. And he said, come follow me. Come follow me. And they followed him. He didn't just say, oh, all, all I need is I'm just looking for one good Christian. That's all I need. He didn't say that. He called 12. said, follow me. Let's go. We're going to change the world. God is looking for men who are sold out for Christ. Sold out. So don't ever think that you need to do this on your own. Don't ever think that you can do this on your own or need to do this on your own. And don't need the fellowship. You know, um, 
One time, uh, I was driving behind, uh, I was going on my way to work. And I was on my way to work, and I was driving, listening to 99.9, listening to the pastors preach. And I was on behind this truck, this big rig. And as I'm, I wasn't even paying, I, I was, wasn't really reading, I, I started to read the stuff behind this big rig. And says, how's my driving? How's this? You know, I was like, call this guy right now. No, I was just kidding. But I was, I, was, I, was, I was behind this big rig. I saw something there on this truck, very important. There was two arrows. I don't know if you guys seen that. One arrow pointing this left and one arrow pointing right, right? You guys know what that means? Passing side, suicide. That's right. One of them said right side. One arrow was pointing this way and said right side. The other arrow was pointing this way and it said suicide. This is the right side to fellowship with men. When you and we decide to say, I'm, I'm doing this on my own, that's suicide, man. Mm -hmm. That's suicide. Amen. That's suicide. We don't need that in our lives. We don't need that. What happened to uh, Judas? Uh, he, he, you know, he, he committed suicide. He, he, didn't, he didn't want to be with the rest. I don't want to follow God and follow those other disciples. Betray Jesus. We don't need that. It's a very dangerous position to be. To isolate yourself. And draw yourself away from the men.